Dynamic programming is a powerful design technique that combines the correctness of brute force and the efficiency of greedy algorithms. There are two common use cases for it. Finding an optimal solution, for example, we may want to find a minimum or a maximum answer to some question, or counting the total number of solutions that some problem may have. These are not the only types of problems that DP solves, but they're the most common. The method was invented by Richard Bellman in the 1950s. Dynamic programming is somewhat of a weird name, so don't look too much into it. Fun fact is that Bellman invented this name because he wanted to hide the fact that he was doing mathematical research. The reason he was hiding this is because the Secretary of Defense in Washington had a pathological fear and hatred for the word research. Using the term dynamic programming made it hard for anyone to express disapproval as it was quite generic. Dynamic programming appears in many interview questions and is generally seen as a difficult topic. However, if you understand the fundamentals and solve enough problems, you will get good at solving them, and who knows, maybe you'll even enjoy them. Dynamic programming is about identifying and solving all subproblems. While the general idea is simple, identifying what subproblem to solve can sometimes be hard. Good news is that the human brain is generally good at pattern recognition. So the more problems we solve, the better we become at identifying what sub-problems to solve quickly. We will look at four problems in this video, starting with the basics. Future videos will cover more dynamic programming problems, so don't forget to subscribe to get notified. Let's start with a classic Fibonacci problem. We want to write a function, Fib of n, that returns the nth Fibonacci number. The first and the second Fibonacci numbers are one. To generate the next number, we sum the previous two. For example, the sixth Fibonacci number is 8. We calculate it as the sum of the previous two numbers, which in this case are 3 and 5. Let's write a naive recursive solution to solve this problem. The base cases for the recursion are 1 and 2. Otherwise, we return the sum of the two previous Fibonacci numbers. This is a very simple solution, but it has a problem. Let's print the seventh Fibonacci number. We get 13. But what happens if we try to print the 50th Fibonacci number? It's very slow. Let's see why by visualizing how this function is executed. To calculate Fib of 5, we need to compute Fib of 4. And then to calculate Fib of 4, we need to compute Fib of 3. And to compute Fib of 3, we need to compute Fib of 2. Finally, we know that Fib of 2 is the base case, so we return 1. We continue calculating Fib of 3, which requires now Fib of 1, that's also 1, and we finally can say that Fib of 3 is 2. We go back to calculating Fib of 4, now we need Fib of 2 again. So this is 1, and the sum is 3, so Fib of 4 is 3 now. Now we go back to calculating Fib of 5, and we need the second part of the equation, which is Fib of 3, and to calculate Fib of 3, we go through the same process again. So we need Fib of 2 and Fib of 1. Now we can sum these and get 2, and finally, we can calculate Fib of 5, which gives us a result 5. As you can see, this was a very long process and a lot of iterations just to get to the result for Fib of 5. Can you tell me what the time complexity of this function is? We can assume that the numbers fit in a word, which means additions are fast. Let's say the running time is t of n, which is t of n minus 1 plus t of n minus 2 plus o of 1. Constant is for additions and other simple operations that we run in this function. The time complexity is the same as the nth Fibonacci number, which is the golden ratio to the nth power, meaning it's very slow. Another way to look into this is to see that t of n is at least 2 times t of n minus 2, because the bigger the n is, the more work we need to do. This means that the time complexity doubles for each recursive call, and we are subtracting 2 until we get to the base case. We can subtract this half n times, so the complexity of this function is at least O of 2 to the power of n over 2. Notice that we are doing the same computations multiple times. For example, we have already computed Fib of 3, but we are repeating the computation later. We should only do it once. There is a general approach to improve algorithms like this one, and this approach is called memoization, which means remember in Latin. Let's go back to our implementation. The idea is to remember the computation of each Fibonacci number and compute it at most once. 
We can do this by storing the computed value in the dictionary. Let's call it memo. Memo is initially empty. Next time we want to return the nth Fibonacci number, we first check if it's in the dictionary, and if so, we don't need to run the whole computation. The computation is replaced by a single dictionary lookup. Notice that the memoized solution is almost identical to the naive solution. This means that you can convert the naive approach to memoized approach for any recursive algorithm in general. Let's see how this algorithm runs with memoization. If we run FIBO50 now, we get a result very quickly. So can you tell me what is the running time complexity of the memoized solution? Well, notice that the recursion is rare in this case. The function will call the recursion only the first time for each value n. Next time, it will retrieve the value from the dictionary, which is fast. This means that the number of non-memoized calls is n. Each non-memoized call, ignoring the recursion part, takes O of 1 to compute. This is why the total running time complexity is linear. And this is the fundamental idea of dynamic programming. Remember the solutions and try to reuse them to solve bigger problems. This is why the biggest challenge when designing a dynamic programming solution is to figure out what are the subproblems that can help you solve the actual problem. So, to summarize, in this implementation, we started from the final problem and recursively computed the subproblems when needed. Another way to look at dynamic programming problems is to start from the bottom up, which means compute the subproblems first. Most people prefer this approach because it doesn't have function calls, which is more efficient in practice. It also allows us to save memory in some cases. For example, to compute Fibonacci, we only need to remember the last two values. So we can delete the value if we know we won't need it anymore to save space. Notice that the solution is the same as the memoized approach, except that we are storing the computed values in the dictionary and iterating over subproblems with a for loop instead of using recursion. When we compute the i-th Fibonacci number, we are assuming that the previous two are already computed. This means that we need to put a bit of thought into the order in which we solve subproblems. It's important to solve dependencies of a subproblem first. Therefore, we have to solve the subproblems in the topological sort order, if you imagine each subproblem being a node and the edges representing dependencies between subproblems. The dependency DAG for Fibonacci subproblems is very simple. Nth number depends on the n minus 1 and n minus 2, and so on. It's usually obvious in what order we need to solve subproblems, but the subproblem dependencies must not form a cycle because it would be impossible to store them in the topological order. Let's move on to the next problem. Given a set of coin values C1 to CK and the target amount of money M, what's the minimum number of coins that can produce the given amount? For example, Let's say that we want to give a customer 734 cents in change using Euro coins. Possible Euro coins are 1, 2, 5, 10, 20, 50, 100, and 200 cents. The optimal solution is to select three coins of 200, one coin of 100, one coin of 20, one coin of 10, and two coins of 2 cents. Do you notice anything interesting here? Well, we're always choosing the largest possible coin until we get to the target amount. This is called the greedy approach because we're choosing the greediest option every time, and it turns out this works for Euro coins. However, it's not immediately obvious that this approach works and actually doesn't work in the general case. For example, imagine that the coins are worth 1, 4, and 5 cents, and the target sum is 13. The greedy approach would produce two coins of five cents and three coins of one cent, which is five coins in total. However, the optimal solution is to use two coins worth four cents each and one coin worth five cents. Can we use dynamic programming to solve this problem? If so, what subproblems do we need to solve? It's usually a good idea to consider the final question you're trying to answer to also be the subproblem for dynamic programming. In this problem, the question is, What's the minimum number of coins that can produce the sum m? If this was our subproblem, what would be a recursive formulation to solve it? Let's say that the function minimum coins represents the minimum number of coins required for a sum m. Clearly, our base case would be minimum coins of 0 
equals zero because no coins are required to form an empty sum. Now let's try to solve a general sub problem, minimum coins of M, assuming that M is greater than zero. Remember when I said that dynamic programming is a bit like a brute force? If we were to implement a brute force solution, how would we do it? If we want to get to the sum 13, we can do that by choosing any of the coins. If we chose coin 5, then we have one coin and we're left with solving the same problem for sum 8. Similarly, if we choose coin 4, we have to solve the same problem for sum 9. And if we choose coin 1, then we have to solve the problem for sum 12. We will keep doing this until we get to the initial position, which is our base case 0. However, notice that we can't go below 0, so we will only choose coins that lead to possible states. For each node in the tree, we try all the possible coins and take the best solution. With this in mind, we can define the recursive solution as minimum coins of m is 0 if m is 0, or we take the best solution after choosing all possible coins c for m greater than 0. Let's try to implement this using the naive recursive approach first. Let's write the function minimum coins. The base case requires no coins, while in other cases we want the minimum across all subproblems plus an extra coin to get to m. Negative subproblems don't exist, so we ignore those. We are using the min ignore none helper function to ignore none values because some subproblems may not have a solution. Let's run this function for sum 13 and coins 1, 4, and 5. We get the result 3 because we can form 13 as 4 plus 4 plus 5. What happens if we run it for the sum of, say, 150? Similar to the recursive Fibonacci, this is very slow. Luckily, we know about memoization, so we can use this trick to speed up our solution. Let's store the computation in the memo dictionary and return it if it's already computed. This solution is much faster and returns the value 30 immediately. The reason this function is efficient is because the answer for each subproblem is calculated recursively only once. After it was computed once, it can be efficiently retrieved the next time the function is called for the same parameter. The time complexity is O of m times k, where k is the number of coins and m is the target sum. This is because we iterate over each coin to find the best solution for each subproblem. Now let's provide a bottom-up solution using a loop to calculate the solution for all the sums up to m. First, we store the solution for the base case, which is 0. Then iterate over each subproblem and each coin type. Ignore the negative subproblems and keep the best solution. Notice that we are calling the function get on the dictionary, which returns none instead of raising an error when the key is missing. Both memoization and the bottom-up approach are good solutions. The bottom-up approach has a lower constant factor and it's slightly shorter, which is why I personally prefer it. From now on, I will only use the bottom-up approach in the final solutions. Nevertheless, it is often easier to think about dynamic programming problems in terms of recursive functions, so the thinking process will remain the same. Now let's see a variant of this problem. Instead of finding the minimum number of coins to form a sum m, let's find in how many ways can we form the given sum m. For example, given coins 1, 4, and 5, in how many ways can we form a sum of 5? There are four ways in which we can do that. Using all ones, using 1 and 4, and vice versa, and a single coin 5. Let's try to construct a recursive solution. Choosing a coin 5 takes us to 0. 0 is the starting point, so it's a good candidate for the base case. The question is, what is the answer for the base case? In how many ways can we construct 0? Well, our only option is to choose no coins, so that's one way in which we can form the zero. This path represents the choice of a single coin with value 5. Another option is to choose coin 4, which takes us to the subproblem 1. In how many ways can we construct 1? To find the answer, we solve the subproblem for 1. We repeat this process for every coin. In the final solution, we want to know in how many ways we were able to reach zero. We can take the sum of solutions across all subproblems to get a final answer. Let's go and implement the bottom-up solution. 
Note that this is going to be very similar to the previous problem. The only differences are the base case and taking the sum instead of the minimum. Let's run this solution on the example we saw earlier. Before finishing this video, let's look at one more counting problem. Imagine an n by m grid. A rabbit is in the top left corner and wants to go to the bottom right corner. It can only go down or right. In how many ways can it reach the bottom right corner? For example, for a 2 by 3 grid, there are three ways in which the rabbit can get to the bottom right corner. Right, right, down, right, down, right, and down, right, right. Again, let's start in the exact same way as before by defining a subproblem. Our goal is to find in how many ways the rabbit can get to the bottom right corner, given the grid n by m. So let's use that for the subproblem. It's helpful to visualize the problem. So let's look at a bigger 6x9 grid. If the rabbit moves down, then we are reducing the problem to a 5x9 grid, because it can't go back. Similarly, if the rabbit moves right, then we are further reducing the problem to a 5x8 grid. Since the rabbit can only move down or right, we are always reducing the problem to a smaller grid. Notice that when the rabbit gets to the last row or column, it can only keep moving in one direction until it reaches the bottom right corner. Once the rabbit gets to the bottom right corner, it has no more moves left. It's often useful to think about corner cases like this one when trying to construct a base case. In this case, we can say that the rabbit has only one way to get to the bottom right corner for a grid of size one by one, which is by not moving at all. Okay, so let's go back and try to construct a recursive solution. If we want to solve the problem for a 4 by 6 grid, in how many ways can we do that? Since the rabbit can move down or to the right, we need to take into account both options. If the rabbit moves down, then the number of solutions is the same as for the grid 3 by 6. And if it moves to the right, then the number of solutions is the same as for the grid 4 by 5. Since it can go in either direction, we can take the sum of both subproblems. Also, Notice that our formula doesn't quite work when one of the coordinates is 1 because it requires the solution for the grid of size 0, which we haven't defined. One way we can solve this is by expanding on our base case. For example, we can say that the grid with at least one dimension of 1 is the base case because we already know that there is only one way to get to the bottom right corner once the rabbit gets to the last row or column. Let's try to convert this into code. We want to populate the memo dictionary such that memo of n, m gives us the solution. Let's initialize the base cases first by iterating over all grids with at least one dimension of 1. We can do this with two for loops. After initializing the base cases, let's populate the memo dictionary for all sizes using our recursive formula. We start from the size 2 by 2 because the grids including size of 1 are base cases. Finally, we return the solution for n by m. How many paths do you think exist for an 18 by 6 grid? What about 75 by 19? Okay, so we have solved a couple of basic dynamic programming problems at this point. In the future videos, we will tackle more complex ones. I'd like to finish this video with a couple of important points that you should take out from this video. When you're trying to solve dynamic programming problems, start by defining the subproblem. For simpler problems, subproblems usually have the same form as the actual problem. After defining a subproblem, try to figure out what is the base case. Finally, try to come up with a recursive formula that solves a generic case. And remember, visualization is your friend here. Don't forget to subscribe to get notified about the future dynamic programming videos. Also, if you've enjoyed this video, please hit the like button because it will tell me that it's worth making content like this. And see you in the next one.